Is everybody full from lunch and ready for the last couple of lectures of this program? All right. So let's, let's go. Um, yesterday, for those of you that were here, we, I talked about uh, DNS and high-performance computing, some of the issues with the algorithms and how to um, write algorithms and, and program them on uh, modern um, supercomputers that include accelerators and, um, and lots of latencies. Towards the end of my lectures yesterday, I started to describe some examples of, to illustrate the role that DNS can play on today's supercomputers. And in particular, we talked about lifted uh, turbulent uh, jet flames. So I'd like to continue presenting some other classes of examples uh, that are relevant to both uh, the development of models for compression ignition IC engines as well as for stationary reheat gas turbines. And then I'd like to say, if, uh, present another class of examples uh, having to do with, with very high uh, intensity turbulent lean premixed jet flames uh, that are used uh, for, again, gas turbines um, primarily for propulsion. So uh, part four um, is uh, DNS for these um, auto-ignition at high pressure, including multi-stage auto-ignition, low temperature ignition, followed by high temperature ignition, as well as mixed mode propagation. So let's start. <clears throat> to give you some background, I'd like to first describe some of the canonical laminar um, flame structures that we anticipate will be present in these um, high, high pressure engine types of environments that span the negative temperature coefficient regime where ignition delays are, are longer as you increase the temperature around 750 to about 900 Kelvin at high pressure. Uh, then I'll describe a simple uh, canonical 2D uh, dimethyl ether mixing layer auto ignition, two stage ignition that spans NTC regime, uh, this would be a scalar mixing layer with 2D so-called isotropic turbulence. It's really not true turbulence. It's a ways to wrinkle and, and strain out the, um, the auto-ignition kernels and the subsequent flames that form. Then uh, we'll go into a little bit more complex three-dimensional configuration, and that would correspond to a turbulent auto-ignition of a, of a more realistic uh, diesel uh, single component surrogate fuel endodecane, and we'll be describing that in a time evolving jet, uh, which is a little bit simpler and computationally more expedient uh, than a spatially evolving uh, real jet uh, that basically takes a window that is advected along with the mean convective velocity um, in time rather than in space using Taylor's hypothesis. Then the last um, example I want to present is what we are currently working on. Uh, with the help of adaptive mesh refinement, we can now do 3D um, turbulent auto-ignition in spatially evolving impulsively, impulsive jets uh, for direct injection kinds of environments. And we'll talk about multi-injection. So what happens when you inject not only the, the primary injection, but you may precede that with a pilot which helps to set the stage, the mixture formation, temperature, enthalpy, and radicals for a main injection that follows. Then the second topic I'd like to describe today has to do with reheat combustion in what, I, what are um, axially staged gas turbines for power generation. We talked about that a little bit yesterday um, in that there, there are changes afoot to, um, to help ensure fuel flexibility and load flexibility in the face of intermittent um, renewable energy sources like wind and solar. And so reheat is a concept that many of the gas turbine manufacturers are, are interested in actively working in. So let's go forward with the diesel uh, problem first. And so diesel engines, um, and especially low temperature combustion versions of those, are used for trucks and for uh, shipping in big marine engines. Uh, for the foreseeable future, and I think that will continue because the energy density of liquid hydrocarbon fuels are, is much higher than 
than, um, than anything else, and especially with electric, electrical uh, engines. There are, however, important regulations for pollutant emissions, and especially there's concern about um, generation of soot particles that are, are really small on the order of two and a half nanometers because of their ingestion. Um, and when you breathe them, they, they stay lodged in your lungs and, and are, are a hazard to human health. Um, <clears throat> engine design, as you know, spans a huge parameter space uh, of, of different operating conditions, different load speed loads and speeds across the, the operating map, and it includes complex multi-physics that we described yesterday. Um, in, in addition to the gas phase interaction of the chemistry with the turbulence, you also have uh, multi-phase spray atomization, spray vaporization, and um, particulate, and emissions, and, and, and thermal radiation to consider. Uh, the, now, while DNS is, uh, is very useful at providing fundamental insights and providing validation data to assess model development. In the end, um, engine designers in, in, at, in industry need uh, predictive engineering tools that have fast turnaround so they can cover a broad range of parameter space on a, a workstation or a, a local cluster. And this will help aid their design and, and optimizing uh, the design of both the engines as well as the fuels. Uh, the model development, however, requires more uh, high fidelity data that both experiments in combination with computation can, can hopefully provide. So there's been uh, a great deal of progress in our community, um, especially the engine community. There's an effort called the Engine Combustion Network, and if you're interested in that, you can look it up on the internet at this uh, URL that's listed, and um, experiments are now able to measure the mean flame structure. They can get information regarding global observables, such as the liftoff length, uh, where the flame is stabilized downstream off of the injector. That's called LOL, and, or tau, which is the ignition delay time. So when does um, ignition occur relative to the motion of the piston as you isentropically compress the charge? And so they're interested in, in controlling the initial uh, start of combustion through controlling the ignition um, timing. Some of the diagnostics that are commonly used by engine uh, community are, are things like time-resolved Schlieren images that measure the density gradients, uh, laser incandescence for measuring things like soot, planar laser or planar laser-induced fluorescence imaging of uh, some of the intermediate species for combustion, such as formaldehyde or low temperature species, OH hydroxyl radical for a high temperature marker, and chemiluminescence, which is another integrated line of sight type of measurement that can tell you where reactions, high temperature reactions are occurring. And a lot of observations, for example, are shown, are, are, uh, are possible nowadays with, with these advanced laser diagnostics. And so some of these images here on the upper right corner show um, the, the sequence of auto-ignition and flame stabilization events that occur inside of a, inside of a high-pressure uh, combustion vessel representing some of the engine conditions. However, even with these diagnostics, there are still many things that can't be measured and a lot of the details that can't be resolved, at least not down to the fine scales um, particularly, this is, this is made more difficult as you move up into pressure because the scales get much smaller for both the turbulence as well as for the ignition fronts and, and, flame, and flames that, that are generated. And so a lot of that information is either you know, not available or it's, um, it's not well resolved by measurement, either through lower dimensional measurements or line of sight measurements. So there still remains a lot of open questions regarding how flames are stabilized, uh, liftoff lengths and so on, what's the mechanism when you have multi-stage ignition of some of these complex fuels and complicated mixture formation uh, induced by entrainment and mixing processes. There's also uncertainties with uh, ignition dynamics. Uh, you know, how do you ignite from low temperature ignition and, and then sequentially on up to high temperature ignition a flame? <coughs> 
And can you do that uh, you know, at, at prescribed timings with respect to um, the uh, overall engine compression expansion strokes? So as I said, industry uh, can't rely on DNS because we can only do a few hero runs um, in a given time, but it really requires uh, reduced order models through uh, currently RANs, um, both steady and unsteady Reynolds average and Aubrey Stokes, and increasingly moving into large eddy simulation, where, as I said yesterday, the large scales are resolved, the subgrid scales uh, require models. The performance so far uh, in the RANs and LES um, modeling that's available seem to be pretty good for global ob observables, but less, less promising right now for fine details. And as I said, it's hard to discriminate between the different subgrid models uh, due to the lack of data. And so we'll use DNS uh, to try to help provide a little bit more information uh, for model assessment. And so in this, uh, these images here, the upper um, set of images here represents the um, LIF, uh, laser-induced fluorescence, I think, of OH or formaldehyde from the experiments. And then this bottom set, of pan set here corresponds to LES of those same um, engine conditions. The top row is large eddy simulation whereas the bottom four rows represent RAN, different RANS models that are trying to approximate uh, or model this, this um, sequence of ignition events. On the right here is a blow up of one specific RANS model using a transported probability density function method <clears throat> that uh, seems to do a fairly good job in capturing the sequence of um, the ignition transients from low temperature reactions to uh, very fast high temperature reactions where the, at the leading edge of the plume where a lot of the low temperature um, reactions have been consumed uh, the, or the keto hydroperoxide radicals are consumed. And then you have expansion of the plume um, into the high temperature regions. And then eventually you have a uh, stabilized um, high temperature flame, diffusion flame, uh, stabilized somewhere off the, the, lifted off of the injector at a, at a prescribed liftoff length that approximately seems to be captured uh, or compared well with experiments. So this is a little bit more close-up view of one of the recent uh, large eddy simulations performed by Sabendu Sam at Argonne National Labs showing the auto-ignition sequence again of the jet, which issues from left to right. And um, this, I think, is the heat release rate uh, of the spray A flame. And you can see ignition, low temperature ignition happening along the interface between the fuel and the oxidizer, um, where these yellowish uh, zones are located. And then it quickly transitions to the, uh, lead, the entire uh, leading edge of this plume uh, that auto ignites. And so some of the challenges here uh, in these LES simulations that the turbulence is extre extremely strong, very high Reynolds numbers, and they're highly transient uh, processes. And as I said, there's pre yesterday there are mixed mode combustion, there's premixed flame fronts involved in the stabilization and in the propagation of the um, ignition, both in the cool flame, hot flame, or hot, hot ignition to the formation of a flame that eventually reaches the, uh, propagates towards the stoichiometric um, mixture fraction surface. So most of the current models are specific to premixed or non-premixed flames, and it's still a lot of, uh, there still needs to be a lot of research to figure out how to treat partially premixed flames propagating into ignited mixtures. Uh, to be a little bit more specific of the conditions of um, a diesel low temperature combustion uh, conditions for spray A, I'd like to show you some of the parameters. And in particular, uh, we, the ambient gas temperature here is about 900 Kelvin. And that can be oftentimes is uh, done in reduced air where um, you have EGR and uh, reduced oxygen, sorry, uh, you, you know, between 10, 15%. Uh, and, um, and 
typical LES computational sizes are on the order of um, several centimeters, six, maybe six centimeters in the axial length of the jet uh, by about five centimeters in the um, other two directions. And typically the injector diameter, his um, nozzle outlet diameter is pretty small. It's on the order of um, 90 microns. And fuel injection pressures are extremely high, 1,500 bar. Um, and fuel injection temperatures are 360 Kelvin. And, and injection durations are about one and a half milliseconds. So um, in the context of premixed flames and ignition for, for diesel combustion, <clears throat> the ignition delay, um, that is how quickly the mixture, um, if left itself, will auto-ignite, is controlled by the combined effect of the chemistry, the ignition kinetics for the low temperature, intermediate temperature, and high temperature chemistry of a given fuel. And there are lots of variations, especially in the low temperature chemistry regime. If you went to Professor Curran's talk, if you talk lectures earlier, you'll see that there are lots and lots of differences in how molecules are arranged that affect low temperature ignition. Uh, generally, in the intermediate temperature regime, you have um, the primary reaction is the thermal dissociation of hydrogen peroxide at these high pressures, H2O2, that branches and forms um, two hydroxyl radicals, OH, that then lead to, to significant chain branching and thermal explosion. And all of these large hydrocarbon fuels end up, in the end, with hot ignition described by hydrogen-oxygen kinetics uh, through the, the, the uh, thermal uh, chain, thermal um, explosion and, and chemical chain branching processes. The ignition delays are um, combined here in a turbulent environment, and there are a lot of, there's very strong coupling between the mixing history and how ignition proceeds. Um, you, can, you can speed ignition up or slow it down depending on the timing of, of, of um, diffusional processes of heat and mass relative to the chemical time scales. Uh, in addition, the liftoff length here, once you have gone through the transient ignition process and you're stabilizing a stationary lifted flame, it's affected by both um, it is, it is affected by the local premixed combustion mode uh, that is determined largely by the competition between auto ignition and premixed flame propagation. And this has to be accounted for in diesel spray flame modeling. Now, what determines whether you're going to have uh, more auto ignition versus more premixed flame propagation are the, the gradients spatial gradients in ignition delay time that are present in the mixture. And those, that is based on a theory that uh, was established a long time ago by uh, Zeldovich in, back in 1980, where he classified different reaction front propagation regimes for exothermic uh, fronts in stratified mixtures. Here, stratification can be with respect to temperature, it can be with respect to composition, or it could be res with respect to the chemical properties of the fuel, such as the, its reactivity. So we know diesel fuels are more reactive than gasoline or isooctane fuels. So it depends on things like the cetane number, octane number. Uh, but in the end, the, what really controls uh, how fast reaction fronts propagate and what mode of combustion you have are the ignition delay gradients. Those gradients can be set out by a, at an initial mixture uh, stratification level, but then they're typically modulated, either increased, enhanced, or dissipated in the presence of entrainment, turbulent mixing, as you get in an engine cylinder from, sim from um, tumble, tumbling motion, swirling motions, opening, closing valves, piston motion. And so those gradients will change drastically over time or over the phasing of the, of the engine. So uh, as I just mentioned, uh, we have both the presence of flames or deflagration fronts um, and spontaneous ignition. <clears throat> the, in general, when you have large spatial gradients in ignition delay time, these will lead to uh, 
favor premixed flame propagation. And in the limit, you have a balance then between diffusion, molecular diffusional transport of heat and mass, and reaction. On the other hand, uh, when you have small gradients in the ignition delay, uh, spatial uh, gradients, and, and in the limit when you have a completely uniform mixture with no gradients, that leads to spontaneous autoignition. And these fronts propagate much faster than premixed flames by orders of magnitude because transport is negligible here and reaction controls how fast uh, these fronts move. And as I said, turbulent mixing can then modify these scalar gradients and change the environment and balance of flames versus spontaneous autoignition. So with DNS, um, as I said yesterday, we have about four to five decades of scales available to directly do, do DNS. Uh, the Reynolds numbers of these diesel jets are, are extremely high initially when they're um, exiting the nozzle. They're on the order of several hundred thousand jet Reynolds numbers. And, uh, and so it's, it's a real problem for DNS because we can't resolve that broad range of uh, turbulent scales. So therefore, we need to target different facets of the problems, you know, and different um, non-dimensional parameters that compare turbulent scales with flame and ignition delay scales and play to the strength of, of the numerical simulations. And so we spent a lot of time um, to, as you would in a physical experiment, to figure out what, what are the right questions to ask that are achievable through DNS simulations that can't be answered, perhaps, by other means. And so in this context, uh, some of the important questions to understand are, are what does the role of NTC and two-stage ignition have on the ignition process itself, the ignition delay, and the subsequent flame stabilization processes. And to try to answer these questions, we target uh, high pressure and NTC regime behavior represented by uh, some very canonical cases, including lifted laminar flames, uh, mixing layer, autoignition, and then adding more, building complexity on that, we start to look at turbulent jet ignition, first of a single injection and later by multiple injections, starting from a time evolving configuration and then moving towards a spatially developing simulation. So let's first talk about lifted laminar flames. <clears throat> uh, conventional diesel combustion is, resembles a, a bunch of quasi-steady lifted flames um, it, when, once the ignition process is over and you have a stationary flame. And the stabilization mechanism is uh, still somewhat unclear. And uh, so we tried to investigate this with the simplest of fuels that exhibit two-stage NTC behavior, and um, this is a fuel called dimethyl ether, which is an oxygenated hydrocarbon fuel that um, has a similar reactivity or cetane number to diesel fuel. Uh, we were able to simulate DNS with the 30 species reduced mechanism uh, that has been validated under simpler homogeneous reactor and 1D flame conditions. The mixing layer that we, scalar mixing layer that we simulated is shown here on the right. This is the configuration. So we have on the left an air uh, stream that comes in from the bottom to the top. And on the right, we have a fuel stream of dimethyl ether. And uh, so we have inflow at the bottom and then outflow in all the other directions. I'm sorry, it's also symmetric uh, uh, on the, it's a symmetric um, shear layer on the right uh, as, a, as the boundary condition. And so the pressure here is 40 atmospheres. Um, the oxidant temperature was varied parametrically between 700 and 1500 Kelvin to span low temperature to high temperature, including the NTC regime. And then we diluted this mixture with nitrogen, 70% uh, DME and 30% nitrogen by volume. And the oxidizer was air. So 
I think I talked about this briefly yesterday, but what happens as uh, in this mixing layer is as you increase the ambient temperature from 700 K on the left to 1500 Kelvin on the right, what's shown here is the heat release rate uh, by these isocontours once it's formed and established uh, a lifted uh, flame uh, off of the, uh, against the oncoming velocity. And the black solid lines here denote the stoichiometric mixture fraction, whereas the dotted line, black line, denotes the lean, very, very lean conditions, uh, I think 0.01 uh, mixture fraction. And another, another, other points to note are the, where the stabilization point is located is denoted by these um, star asterisk-like symbols here, 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 here. And the leading edge where we see autoignition occurring is denoted by these little square symbols. <clears throat> so there's a couple of things to note as we increase the temperature and the inlet velocity. Um, what you see is a very complicated transition. At ambient conditions, as I described yesterday, you have this uh, tribrachial or triple flame, edge flame, that has been seen experimentally uh, when the temperature is low at ambient to about 700 Kelvin. And so that com is comprised of a, a, a very curved uh, leading premixed branch, uh, a rich a rich um, premixed flame, a lean premixed branch, highly curved, and then uh, behind that, a trailing diffusion flame that exists along the stoichiometric mixture fraction. However, we see, as we increase the temperature to where low temperature ignition and NTC behavior exists in the 900 to 1300 Kelvin regime, we still see the downstream triple flame structure but we start to see additional branches that occur upstream of that stabilization point. And those are due to both low temperature heat release from the, the low temperature ignition chemistry, and they're also due to high temperature, extremely lean um, uh, chemistry from the main ignition, from the um, high temperature hot ignition. Uh, behavior. And then as we go to 1500 Kelvin or above, all the, the low temperature heat release branch vanishes because it's too hot for, for um, low temperature chemistry to occur. And so you end up with a different structure. But in this entire temperature span from 700 to 1500 Kelvin, you can see a wide range of hybrid structures up to five branches. So, and in, in the NTC regime, we see predominantly four branches, um, which we call it a, a, a tetrahedral um, flame or tetrabrachial flame. Uh, the flame speeds are of the order of 10 meters a second, which is comparable uh, with uh, the stabilization uh, location that's observed in diesel um, jets. I should also show that um, on the right bottom side, I don't know if it's too small for you guys to see, but as we increase the ambient temperature from 700 Kelvin in this first picture on, the, on up to 1500 Kelvin, if we do a, a reaction, or if we do a, a budget of OH radical, uh, we can see that uh, where the different curves here represent reaction contribution, the diffusion contributions is shown by the pink lines dotted and dashed for the different directions. Um, advection, which is shown by the gray line, and, um, and then the species mass fraction OH, shown by the solid block line. And what you see is a transition, if you look carefully at the balance of the OH budget, uh, at low temperatures where there's a very strong reaction diffusion uh, balance, as denoted by the green and purple lines balancing one another, to as we increase the temperature, the diffusion becomes negligible in either direction, but convection starts to, t advection starts to play a more substantial role in counterbalancing reaction, indicating that these, you're transitioning more and more to autoignition from 
from just um, premixed flame propagation as we increase the temperature. <clears throat> uh, as I said, both of the upstream branches in these intermediate temperature regime are due to uh, both first and second stage ignition, low temperature heat release, as well as lean high temperature ignition. And it seems that um, the low temperature combustion radical species, uh, such as methoxy methyl peroxy radical for DME, uh, clearly demarcates the low temperature cool flame branch, which is shown in these um, isocontour plots uh, in the lower right hand corner for for methoxy, methyl peroxy in the bottom, it's actually this third row, and it's uh, demarcating this low temperature branch that exists up, upstream of the triple flame. Uh, similarly, formaldehyde behaves a lot like methoxy, methyl peroxy, and I show that because that's one of the species that experimentalists can measure, at least in, in planar um, laser induced fluorescence images. So that'd be a good marker for some of that low temperature soup that the edge flame is trying to propagate into or assisting that propagation. And then OH um, is the traditional high temperature flame marker and it demarcates the, um, uh, in this case, the trailing diffusion flame, which has the most significant amount of OH um, <coughs> downstream of the, the um, stabilization point. And so that's the way you can maybe piece together the different parts of, the, of this um, polybrachial lifted flame. Yeah. Okay, so the, these would be the concentrations of uh, OH, formaldehyde, and... The, the dotted lines that come from, I mean... Oh, sorry. Okay, so the solid line is the stoichiometric mixture fraction, and the dotted line is the extremely lean, um, con uh, lean, like, uh, mixture fraction. So you're practically out in the oxidant, okay. where reactions are just, I mean, there's like 0.01 mixture fraction. Thank you. Thank you. Yep. So we then took these lifted laminar flame structures, these polybrachial flames, and we want to see if they exist uh, in, a, in a turbulent environment. And so we first did just 2D pseudo turbulence in, a, again, a, a scalar mixing layer where the, the, well, it's not a scalar mixing layer, but it's a, a where we put, impose 2D isotropic turbulence on top of this, um, on top of the scalar mixing layer that I, sh of the DME mix, DME and, and reduced oxidized, or not, not reduced, just regular ambient air on the other side. And so we kept the conditions um, for the 900 Kelvin case that I just described from the lifted laminar flame study. And so the goal here was to try to observe the, the dynamics, the ignition transient at the same conditions where we saw the polybrachial flames um, uh, were, were occur. <clears throat> and so what's shown here is this, uh, well, this is the, the, the mixing layer, 2D mixing layer, we, where we've imposed um, isotropic 2D turbulence specified by an energy spectrum on top of the mixing layer that I just talked about, and where, where uh, oxidizer is on the bottom half of this, uh, of this domain and fuel is on the top half. And again, this was 70% um, DME um, diluted with 30% nitrogen for the, for the fuel uh, denoted by the blue regions and, and then just regular ambient air at 900 Kelvin. And this whole thing was done again at 40, 40 atmospheres. Um, the evolution in time, this is normalized time is shown by this bottom row. And let me describe what's happening here. And this is, what we're plotting here is the heat release isocontours uh, for, and the, that at showing the progression of ignition and then eventually the establishment of flames, hot flames. And so we look early on in time and, and the, the little white dashed line here represents the stoichiometric mixture fraction in the uh, isosurface. So early on, uh, we start to see little blue spots here that represent low temperature first stage ignition occurring, um, just, just a little bit lean of stoichiometric, so it's occurring on the fuel side. 
and they occur kind of in isolated random spots. If you look, I'm not going to show these results, but these spots first occur where the mixing rates are very low. So they want to have nice shelter environments to build up a radical pool and, and heat. Then a little bit later in time, once the low temperature ignition has happened, what, what occurs is that these kernels migrate or propagate over to richer and richer mixtures. So they cross the stoichiometric line, and you'll start to see uh, low temperature ignition and cool flame, that methoxymethyl peroxy radical, occurring on the fuel-rich side. So you can see pretty much at 0.8, a, lo a lot of ignition has happened along that entire interface, the stoichiometric interface, and a lot of it has crossed over into richer mixtures. And this occurs mainly by a, a, um, uh, a cool flame, laminar flame propagation process, whereas earlier in time, it's primarily an auto-ignition process of low temperature um, auto-ignition. And then um, at these later times, we start to see the random appearance of some hot ignition kernels that occur um, as the cool flames propagate, again, from rich mixtures back to the stoichiometric isosurface. And so here's one example of a hot ignition kernel. And then even later in time, these, you see more hot ignition kernels appearing. And when they reach the stoichiometric isosurface, it forms a high temperature edge flame, very similar to what I just described from these polybrachial flames. These hot ignition kernels uh, generate uh, outwardly propagating uh, edge flames <clears throat> that move along the stoichiometric isoline, consuming uh, the fuel. And then these eventually occur at different locations, and they propagate and eventually merge and annihilate with one another. And so this happens until the entire uh, stoichiometric isosurface interface is lit up and it is then stabilized uh, by this mechanism of edge propagation some distance downstream of the injector. We did uh, a budget analysis of at two different times during this 2D turbulent um, simulation. And we see that um, early on in time, on this left column, if we look at the reaction diffusion balance, uh, I think of OH again. I think it was OH. We see that, uh, and we condition it on different um, mixing rates as denoted by the black line, which is the scalar dissipation rate. We see that early on in time, you have reaction denoted by the blue dash line being very strong and diffusion, the blue solid line, counterbalances it, but it's very weak. And so this is predominantly uh, a spontaneous ignition front since reaction is the controlling mechanism compared to transport. And then we see that as we increase the scalar dissipation rate for different kernels that we've done these budgets on, these are the slices of the ignition, low temperature ignition kernels, we see that um, as you increase the scalar dissipation rate, the progress of uh, reaction decreases. So the reaction rates are much lower to the point that where we have extremely high scalar dissipation rates, we've almost completely <laughs> quenched the, um, the low temperature ignition kernel here in, in for kernel D, for example. Then if we go a little bit later in time, once um, cool flame has been, ignition has been established, and is propagating towards richer mixtures, as I just described, then the balance changes. It shifts from a reaction-dominated uh, spontaneous ignition front to a uh, premixed flame. This is a low-temperature premixed cool flame, where reaction and diffusion are nicely counterbalanced. And again, the, the flame uh, is pretty robust to a, a range of scalar dissipation rates or mixing rates. But under very, very high scalar dissipation rates, um, you also uh, can quench a flame, cool flame as well. But it takes a lot of strain rate and scalar dissipation rate to, to quench it. What's interesting is um, that this 
cool flame, um, so we see a spontaneous autoignition transition to a cool flame, and this cool flame moves from um, the preferred mixture fraction under, in, in a homogeneous reactor that occurs a little bit lean of stoichiometric, and then it propagates as a wave into these richer mixtures. And so that's evident here if you look at the um, PDF uh, uh, of the mixture fraction, uh, I'm sorry, the, heat, the conditional, the PDF of the heat release condition on the mixture fraction, I think that's what it is. You see that it starts out in time at leaner conditions and then there's a wave front that kind of moves towards richer and richer conditions. And so the upshot of this is uh, that the cool flame is very instrumental in delivering radicals and enthalpy to richer conditions which take longer time to ignite. And so if you had just a homogeneous environment where there was no stratification at all, those rich mixtures would take a long time to ignite and maybe too long to be of any use in an engine um, by the time you finish your compression stroke and expanding, going to an expansion stroke. But what happens with the cool flame is that it, compared to the um, homogeneous ignition delay time for low temperature shown by the dotted line here, uh, it originates just shy or lean of stoichiometric, and then you can see the um, kernels, these 2D kernels, propagate into very rich mixtures and auto-ignite at times that are much shorter than the homogeneous low temperature ignition delay curve. And in doing that, it then uh, speeds up the time to, for hot ignition to occur by setting the stage and providing these, uh, pr providing the environment for hot ignition to occur. So these cross red lines compared with the zero D hot ignition curve shown in black show that you can actually get much shorter ignition delay times if you factor in this tr uh, stratified uh, low temperature cool flame propagation. So that's a major finding that people didn't realize that came out of DNS work and helped to explain why um, experiments were observing much faster hot ignition across the entire front part of the plume, um, which is different than you would get if you just ran um, homogeneous reactor simulations. We then moved on to <clears throat> uh, looking at a 3D time developing case uh, for, for diesel ignition, again at high pressure, but with a more realistic fuel end of decade, which is what um, was used in the spray A um, experiments. And this is work uh, that was done by my postdoc, Julia Borghese. And this picture shows one of the key low temperature species that's formed um, in, um, in low temperature ignition of large hydrocarbon fuels. This is keto hydroperoxide. So again, our interest here was to understand how transport and low temperature chemistry affect ignition in uh, low temperature diesel combustion. And as I showed before, if we look at the um, a plot of temperature versus mixture fraction, you at, time, at early times, you have this frozen mixing line where you just have mixing with, with no reactions occurring. But as time progresses um, in the direction of this arrow, you see the um, low temperature ignition occurring and propagating again out into rich uh, mixtures as, as maybe a wave front. And then um, this then ignites hot ignition, which occurs uh, on the rich side, and it propagates back to stoichiometric where it lights up a flame at stoichiometric conditions. So this is what we wanted to see, whether it occurs for this more complex, large uh, hydrocarbon fuel compared with DME, a dilute mixture of DME. So we've learned in time from, especially from Nandis Mastarakos, that um, high temperature ignition prefers to, uh, occurs at a preferred mixture fraction where the ignition, homogeneous ignition delay is minimum. And so that's what this plot in the upper right corner is showing is that the ignition delay has a minimum uh, for a given uh, pressure and, uh, and, <clears throat> and mixture, uh, pr pressure and ambient temperature 
um, you see different um, minimum um, ignition delay times. And so that's likely to the uh, mixture composition where you expect to see ignition occurring first before it starts to propagate out from that location. We also know from um, high temperature ignition that uh, it prefers to occur in a, in a sheltered environment. So I'm plotting here the ignition delay versus the strain rate or scalar dissipation rate on the abscissa. And so as you strain an ignition kernel, eventually um, the ignition delay time takes longer and longer to to uh, where it takes an extraordinarily long time at high uh, mixing rates to auto-ignite. And that's for the reasons that I said that you're losing radicals and, and heat out of the um, uh, kernels as they're trying to build up. So <clears throat> one thing that was shown from diesel engine experiments in, in a combustion vessel at high pressure is the uh, transient evolution of this low temperature to high temperature ignition, as denoted by formaldehyde images on the left column here, by Schlieren images in time uh, on the right column here. And if we zoom in on a couple of features of this jet that's issuing from left to right, we see that, um, and this, if we look at just the Schlieren images, which denote density gradients, and so you can imagine that as you go through low temperature ignition and it generates a tiny bit of heat, the temperature go up and the density gradient will, will go down. And so what, we, what this has been observed by experiments is that the, uh, the plume that the impulse of the jet that forms this, the, and the leading edge of this plume, you see on the edges between the, the, uh, the fuel vapor and the, and the ambient air the, at this location A, um, the, the weakening and disappearance of the uh, contrast in the Schlieren at 20 microseconds later, where low temperature ignition has occurred. Subsequently, you see another kernel here, at another location B, where um, again, on the edges of the plume, where, where you see low temperature ignition happen. Again, the contrast disappears in about 20 microseconds uh, later at point B, and likewise up and down the edges of the shear layer, uh, until finally the entire leading edge leading edge of this plume, the front end of this plume completely vanishes, the contrast vanishes as it kind of ignites very rapidly um, all of the mixture across, across the entire jet. And that's also shown from formaldehyde images, uh, imaging on the, on the right. You can see that um, from the experiment you get um, the highest uh, uh, Ignition, the ignition occurs pr primarily on the edges of the shear layer first before it goes towards the leading edge of the plume. So that's the kind of information you can get from the experiments. Uh, so we wanted to get a little more clarification from DNS, so we simulated a time-evolving endodecane jet at 25 bar with reduced oxygen, as in the experiment, and at 960 Kelvin ambient temperature. And our mixture here was uh, the peak mixture fraction in our DNS was about 0.3, because we did not consider the atomization vaporization process of the spray. Uh, but this is the mixture fraction, peak mixture fraction, fraction that <coughs> is observed uh, just prior to where reactions start to, uh, start to commen or commence. The kinetics that we used um, are reduced. This is based on a 35 species uh, mechanism that includes high temperature oxidation uh, as well as low temperature oxidation um, pathways. And it was optimized against very detailed chemistry mechanisms um, developed at Lawrence Livermore National Labs for, for engines. And, and the high temperature branch came from uh, USC. And low temperature branch, low temperature oxidation chemistry is from Bekus and, and Norbert Peters. The fuel jet here, um, we couldn't do the full uh, Reynolds number, the high Reynolds number case, so what was achievable from the DNS is a Reynolds number of about 7,000 in the jet, which corresponds to a turbulent Reynolds number based on the integral scale and the turbulence intensity of about 1,000, so this is 950. And this ended up being a very expensive calculation um, due to the, the very, very small mesh spacing that was required, three microns uh, mesh spacing is needed to resolve these very, very thin ignition fronts at high pressure. Uh, 
Uh, to do this required three billion cells, and um, computational domain was on the order of, of about uh, several millimeters to a centimeter, and we could simulate out to about one millisecond of physical time with, with resolving all of the chemistry and, and diffusional processes, turbulence processes, uh, to observe both ignition and propagation of the burning flame throughout the domain. Just to reiterate for endodecane, if you look at the ignition delay plot versus mixture fraction, you can see there is this um, low temperature ignition, it's denoted by the red line, dashed line, high temperature second stage ignition is denoted by this black line where the stoichiometric mixture fraction occurs about 0.05. And you can see that the uh, similar to what was predicted for hot ignition by uh, Nandis uh, Masterakos, there is a preferred mixture fraction for both the low temperature and the high temperature ignition stages. So we'd, we'd anticipate the first ignition kernels to occur at these mixture fractions, where at the preferred mixture fractions. And then hot in endodecane, um, unlike DME, the low temperature ignition um, is, is um, uh, occurs uh, through uh, chain branching of the OH radical uh, that's generated from hydrogen abstraction reactions, from internal isomerization reactions. <clears throat> and, and it generates um, things like keto hydroperoxides and various other peroxy radicals in the low temperature uh, ignition process. It then sub and accompanying that is, is a few, a couple hundred uh, degree temperature increase in a, as shown by this red line, and a small amount of heat release. It's slightly exothermic. What then transpires is that you form, go into an intermediate temperature range where you're generating a lots of hydrogen peroxide radical. And then, as I said earlier, that peroxide, uh, hydrogen peroxide radical then dissociates and thermally dissociates and forms hot ignition and establishes a high temperature flame. And so we use H2O2 to monitor the end of low temperature ignition in this intermediate temperature phase, and then we use OH uh, radical or other high temperature species to denote, denote the hot, hot ignition and, and flame formation. And then I, was, I just want to point out that the, often in these engine type of conditions, you see large disparities between the ignition delay times for this first stage and second stage ignition. In this case, there's about a three to four X difference in homogeneous ignition delay times. And this would suggest that a la large fraction of the first stage ignition occurs in the volume prior to um, the second high temperature stage going off. If, they were, if that disparity was less, you might see lots of overlap between low temperature and high temperature ignition in the domain. Let me show you a movie so you can get an idea of the dynamics of the auto ignition process for this two stage endodecane ignition. So on the left, I will be showing you uh, keto hydroperoxide, or KEAT, um, and, and also to represent the first stage ignition. And I'll show you temperature above 1150 Kelvin, which represents the beginning of hot ignition. On the right um, will be a slice through the volumetric image on the left, showing the evolution of the hydrogen peroxide mass fraction. So these are all quantities that are not possible to measure, but we can get that from computation. So let me play it. So now you see on the edges of this shear layer, jet, this, this jet, you see keto hydroperoxide forming, propagating into the rich central core of the jet. And then on the, on the rich side, you then uh, start to see the appearance of hot ignition kernels, these orange spots occurring. And then these will propagate, these start to populate everywhere on the rich side of the jet, and then they propagate back towards the stoichiometric mixture fraction isosurface uh, and light up these edge flames so you, and consume the fuel. So you'll see this occurring. If we try to quantify this with statistics, I'm plotting here the conditional statistics of temperature in the top row, 
hydrogen peroxide in the middle row and keto hydroperoxide in the bottom row, where the red line denotes the conditional mean, and the, um, the vertical lines are the standard deviation of that conditional mean. And so initially, you can, let's follow the temperature evolution. We start from a frozen mixing line, uh, where temperature's uh, about 960, and, and um, on the oxidant side, down to uh, you know, ambient temperature for the fuel. And then sometime later, we start to see uh, low temperature ignition occurring <clears throat> close to stoichiometric conditions where that, pre that minimum um, ignition delay time occurred in the homogeneous case. And then it propagates out towards richer mixtures. Eventually, it lights up on the hot ignition on the rich side. About this time here, you start to see temperatures exceeding about 1150 Kelvin. And then the te mean temperature propagates towards the stoichiometric isosurface. Uh, likewise, you see low temperature radicals like keto hydroperoxide and other peroxy species form at the minimum, uh, at the preferred mixture fraction and propagate as a wave towards richer mixtures. It gets consumed uh, at the end of first stage ignition. And hydrogen peroxide kind of lags a little bit behind heat species, the peroxy species in its involvement. Uh, it also see, you can see this little dip in the conditional mean of H2O2 at this time from the red solid lines that indicates it's going away as hot ignition um, initially starts at a mixture fraction of about 0.16. Yeah? So those lines are the Yeah. Excuse me? The base Yes, it is. So if we try to understand what the role of turbulent mixing is on this process, we can uh, doubly condition the data, not only on mixture fraction, as I showed you in the previous plot, but also on, we can bit them up into regions of low mixing rates and high mixing rates, or scalar dissipation rate. So this is the scalar dissipation rate of the mixture fraction. Um, and these arrows here indicate the progression of ignition and time for temperature in the top row. Uh, I guess it's temperature in both, both the rows at different, at low dissipation rate and high dissipation rate. Um, and, and so what you see is, for, let's first look at the low scalar dissipation rate evolution. What you see is this propagating wave from the minimum preferred mixture, minimum ignition delay, preferred mixture fraction for low temperature ignition on into richer mixtures. And you can see in time this, this nice wave, just a lot of structure moves to the right. Um, if, and that's shown by the, the second frame here is Keat. The third frame here is H2O2, which also behaves very similar as this wave structure moves to the right. A tiny bit of it is consumed here in the dip that we saw in the previous plot uh, due to the first appearance of high temperature ignition that uh, were H2O2 is dissociated. And then it uh, gets consumed as it's propagating towards the stoichiometric isosurface uh, at leaner conditions here. The interesting thing is when you condition it on very high intense mixing rates, you no longer see this wave structure, but you rather you see this very large, expanding, diffusive, turbulent diffusion process um, as you move in time. So you don't see this marching across from lean to rich side, but rather you see a very broad uh, diffusion of Keat as well as um, H2O2. And we also, when we compare the temperature evolution between the low dis dissipation rate regions and the high dissipation rate regions, we find that low temperature ignition is impeded generally when high scalar dissipation rates are, are around. Um, and so you can see, for example, by the purple line that it hasn't progressed to a high enough temp uh, a temperature uh, as high as it does when you have lower dissipation rates. But oddly enough, the high temperature ignition, as <laughs> denoted by the cyan colored line, happens sooner for high scalar dissipation rate than it does for low dissipation rates. And I think um, the mechanism for that is that while it takes longer to ignite uh, mixtures under low dissipation rate, the hot ignition um, occurs maybe sooner because 
you're increasing the turbulent diffusivity and diffusion of heat and radicals from that bring uh, advect uh, diffuse um, heat and radicals to those locations to create hot ignition center. Uh, we then looked at kind of identifying, whoops, the where in this uh, soup is propagation, flame propagation important, and where what balance of it is spontaneous low temperature ignition, auto ignition. And we could discern that by um, identifying an isoscalar surface for H2O2 at a threshold that uh, represents these low temperature reaction fronts. And then using a marching cubes algorithm, we could compute the distance function um, from this isosurface and construct the normals, the normals to this isosurface. The reason we want the normals to these isosurfaces uh, is in order to construct the source terms, the diffusion and reaction source terms for, for ketohydroperoxide to discern whether it's a flame or a spontaneous ignition front. And you can't do that balance or budget on a given isosurface contour because the maximum values don't coincide in, uh, spatially. So you have to search along each normal till you find its maximum value and then take the magnitude, the ratio of the magnitudes of diffusion and reaction in order to figure out whether you have a spontaneous ignition front or a flame. And so you would have a flame, as I showed before, if you have a nice balance between reaction and diffusion, uh, diffusion in green, reaction in blue, and you would have predominantly spontaneous ignition if you have just reaction being large and diffusion being small. Uh, and so we could form a, a, a so-called Domkohler number for low temperature <coughs> fronts, reaction fronts, based on this keto hydroperoxide uh, isosurface evaluation, uh, taking the ratio of the maximum magnitude of the reaction rate of Keat to the maximum diffusion rate of Keat. And for large uh, values of the Domkohler number, this ratio, uh, we find that it's uh, predominantly spontaneous ignition. And when the Domkohler number is smaller or order unity, we find it's a premixed cool flame. And so what's plotted here in the upper right then is the fraction of fronts propagating as a flame or a cool flame as we go in time during the evolution of the low temperature ignition. And so you can see that this uh, is non-negligible. Uh, it starts out being uh, somewhere between 25 to 50 percent of the reaction fronts are flames and that increases as you go further in time and that um, kind of sh this uh, and so it's important to, I just want to say, it's important to consider um, low temperature ignition fronts that propagate through these diffusively supported flames. This, yep. Is this done in post-processing, or is this your post-processing to go through this one? Because this is typically like... This is hard, and we ended up doing this as in post-processing. And you saw from that movie how contorted all of this soup is. So trying to find reaction fronts and and filtering out fronts that don't count because they've already reacted or right, what the heat release rate values. It's hard to establish criteria that would isolate this. But we did it as a post-analysis step. In the future, it'd be nice to do this on the fly. So in, in this region, as I, and you can see in these curves, in time it kind of tracks going towards richer and richer mixtures just like we saw from the earlier um, plots. And, and so you have both flames and spontaneous ignition in, in this region and, and um, only flames under very, very lean and very, very rich conditions. Uh, another way, statistical way to, cor to determine whether um, mixing rates are important is to look at the cross correlation between the scalar dissipation rate or strain rate and some of these key low temperature radical species like heat or H2O2. And so what's shown here uh, on the two left images are, are these um, cross correlation, um, cross correlation between dissipation rate and heat uh, at different times, three different times during um, 
the ignition process. And what you see is that in this um, intermediate range of mixture fractions where low temperature ignition is happening, that um, the ignition progress is negatively correlated with the local mi with the mixing rate. And so this kind of goes along with what Mastarakos had found for high temperature ignition, that it, these kernels really want to be in a sheltered environment and, and that um, high mixing rates impede their progress. However, we saw something interesting, which is under very, very lean conditions and under very, very rich conditions over here, they're positively correlated. So this goes from positive correlation to negative correlation to positive. And, and you can kind of see that more clearly if you look at the conditional statistics for temperature, heat, uh, and H2O2 doubly conditioned on the mixture fraction as well as on the, cumulant, uh, the cumulative um, mixing that has occurred to that point. As, and we've kind of bin it up into four bins of low, moderate, high, and super high uh, scalar dissipation rate going from uh, gray to purple colors. And so let's just look at this first column, which is temperature. And the evolution in time is shown by these curves A, B, C, and D. I'm sorry. No, the evolution in time is shown by in each of these plots as you go down this column. But the ranges of scalar dissipation rate from low to high are shown by these different curves, the, going from the um, low dissipation rate in uh, in black to high dissipation rate shown in green. And so consistent with the cross correlation or with the cross correlation analysis, we find that um, temperature is impeded, rise due to ignition is impeded as we increase the cumulative dissipation rate that it's encountered to that point. And this, uh, we also see on the rich side that the opposite is true. You see um, under very high dissipation rates shown in green, here on rich conditions that actually temperature goes up more. And I think it's due to this balance of thermal diffusion, I'm sorry, not thermal, turbulent diffusion of heat and radicals from regions that were not able to ignite due to high dissipation rate um, here that are then transported into these more difficult regions to ignite. And, and, and uh, turbulent diffusion helps to um, accelerate the ignition in these regions. So it's a complicated picture that, that's happening. OK. <clears throat> so to summarize this part, we, we see very similar results to what we found for DME, also now for endodecane. And I think it's generally the, the true for most of the uh, hydrocarbons of interest for, for diesel engines. If we plot the ignition delay time again versus mixture fraction, and we, I'm going to reshow the homogeneous low temperature ignition curve shown in the dotted red line and the hot ignition shown in the black line. And then these islands of blue and red are the low temperature mixture parcels that are auto igniting and the high temperature hot ignition um, fraction of the, those parcels that are igniting. And so you can see that indeed, Low temperature ignition starts at the preferred mixture fraction for, for where the ignition delay time is shortest. Um, and, and it happens first at slightly longer times. It takes a little longer because of the, the mixing that's going on that impedes um, in, uh, the progress of low temperature ignition. So it, it takes longer than the homogeneous case, but it occurs at the same mixture fraction. And then rapidly it propagates uh, into these richer mixtures, just like we saw for DME. And, and that's largely due to this cool flame um, propagation mechanism and through turbulent diffusion, as, we, as I described. This then subsequently bootstraps the high temperature ignition, which also occurs, um, like in the DME case, at very, at richer conditions and uh, at shorter times than would be predicted from the homogeneous um, reactor calculation. So if you had, uh, had neglected all of the turbulent processes, you would have predicted hot ignition and ignition overall in the engine to occur at this time and at this mixture condition. But in fact, it occurs richer and at much shorter times due to this coupling between 
low temperature ignition, cool wave propagation, turbulent diffusion that provides the environment for hot ignition to be accelerated. So to conclude here, we found that um, low temperature reactions create the conditions for hot ignition to occur and they propagate through a diffusively supported cool flame um, and high temperature dissipation appears to delay the low temperature ignition, however it leads to faster ignition under very rich conditions. And I didn't talk about it today, but uh, there, we've also looked at what happens to the edge flame propagation that forms around the stoichiometric mixture fraction isosurface, um, and that's, that's uh, another, another study. So then lastly in this section, um, we moved on to the a, 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 a geometry that's closer to a diesel jet, which is a spatially evolving impulsive jet, and we looked at multiple injections. And uh, the only way we could have done this was, and we did, was to um, uh, apply adaptive mesh refinement because the fronts, as I said in this earlier work, were three microns uh, mesh spacing, which is extraordinarily thin. And trying to um, uniformly mesh across the domain with that fine a spacing would have been prohibitively expensive. So as I said yesterday, we're kind of working towards the exascale and there's this uh, DOE project that um, is uh, sponsoring the development of 25 applications, um, a software stack, um, hardware technology, and eventually deploying integrated exascale supercomputers at uh, several of the DOE leadership class computing facilities. And so we develop, have one of these 25 projects to develop a um, adaptive mesh refinement code, which we've called PELI, and it has both a compressible as well as a LOMOC version, and it's based on block-structured finite volume ad adaptive mesh refinement, and we're slowly including multi-physics beyond just gas phase and turbulence. We're adding uh, polydispersed spray treatment, soot, and radiation, and it also has a real gas treatment when you go up to very, very high pressures uh, where perfect gas uh, may not apply, and uh, we've added a complex geometry capability to this code as well, so using an embedded boundary cut cell approach. As part of this team um, of engineers and chemistry people, CFD people, applied math, numerical people, we've also included a automated mechanism generation um, <coughs> uh, framework developed largely out of Argonne National Labs in Sandia which uh, takes uh, theory-derived chemistry that's been uncertainty quantified, and it generates um, code that's reduced and ready for drop-in into these CFD codes like PELI. And their initial targets are going to be on some of these uh, engine fuels. So very recently, in fact, it's still ongoing work, um, my postdoc, Martin Reith, uh, through uh, sponsorship from the Army has been looking at multi-injection uh, mixing and combustion in these combustion and ignition engine conditions. And so different than just having one injection, multi-injection is, is a strategy that um, allows uh, uh, engines to have higher efficiencies and, and also reduce noise. Um, and it, the main injection, the idea is that you inject a pilot um, at a, a specific time relative to the piston phasing, the combustion phasing in the, in the engine, and you can change the timing of that pilot injection as, as well as its duration. And then you wait a dwell time before you do a main injection. You, you inject the main um, charge, and, which also has a duration. So this is a large parameter space that you can vary. You can vary the timing, the duration of both the pilot and subsequent main injection as well as the dwell time between them. And you can also even change the fuel if you want to consider different reactive reactivities in the pilot um, and, and the main. You can, people have been thinking about looking at additives that you might eject in the pilot to help um, set the conditions for the main uh, ignition, the main jet. And so this is an experiment uh, that was done by uh, Scott Skeen, and I think Mark Musculus has worked on this earlier as well. 
which um, looked at, at Sandia spray A conditions, but with multiple injections. And um, this is a Schlieren image followed by a formaldehyde laser-induced fluorescence image that shows the um, first pulse uh, pilot and then the main injection that follows. And then on the right here, I've just kind of shown, showed you the uh, mixture fraction for both the pilot injection from our DNS as well as the main injection. And the difference here is that the main um, injection would see very, very different conditions, ambient conditions compared to what the pilot sees um, because it's got some leftover enthalpy and, and radicals that are produced from the pilot that it's being injected into. And the question that we wanted to address was how does mixing in different thermochemical conditions affect ignition of the main injection? What determines whether cool flames or high temperature products are produced by the pilot, for example? We did looked at a couple of different use cases. One of the use cases is um, engines for ground transportation, especially for heavy duty diesels. And we uh, tried to simulate the conditions of spray A, 60 atmospheres, 900K ambient, reduced air. So this is with exhaust gas recirculation. And we initially tried an injection schedule where the pilot uh, was injected for half a millisecond, the dwell time was another half millisecond, and then the main um, injection lasted half a millisecond. And we, we tried, the objective here is to try to improve mixture formation and reduce emissions. Uh, a second use case is one that the U.S. Army cares about uh, for high altitude operation of these um, drones, unman uh, these unmanned aerial vehicles or systems. And these operate at very, very different conditions at 10 atmospheres and at very low temperatures at 750 Kelvin rather than 900. And typically this is just ambient air. There's no ga exhaust gas recirculation. The schedule that we looked at here, uh, by comparison or contrast, is a 0.2 millisecond pilot, a dwell time of about a millisecond, and then a, a duration for the main injection of another millisecond or so. The objective that we're trying to achieve here is very different than the ground transportation here. We're trying to reduce the signature um, as well as improve the reliability of ignition and uh, its operation with a diverse range of, of um, fuels. So let's, let's talk about these two cases. As before, um, well, let's see, this is just kind of summarizes the cases. I think I've already described this. Yeah, I have. So these are the cases, the parameters for the cases. And as before, we first get a lot of information by looking at the homogeneous reactor calculations. And so this is the, I've uh, done a trick on you. I've flipped the homogeneous reactor simulations now where mixture fraction is on the ordinate and, and um, time is on the abscissa. So it's those previous curves that I showed you would be oriented in a different direction. Um, on the left is the conditions that we simulated for the ground transportation, and on the right is for the UAV conditions. <clears throat> and as before, um, we expect to see both low temperature ignition um, followed by this long dwell time where H2O2 is accumulating and um, there's no heat release here, and then followed by high temperature um, hydrogen oxygen ignition, explosion ignition. And uh, the difference here in, a, in the homogeneous reactor curves is pretty striking for ground and UAV. On the left, what you see is still two stages, this very faint blue line, purple line, that you can barely see, shows a minimum ignition delay time at a mixture fraction uh, very close or slightly lean of stoichiometric, which is pretty small. Here it's about 0 0.05, 0 0.0446 or so. And so low, low temperature ignition, would we expect it to occur somewhere about here, where that minimum exists. Sometime later, uh, we expect to see hot ignition occurring under slightly rich conditions for this case. Um, and it, the ignition delay times for low and high temperature ignition are um, fractions of a millisecond. For hot ignition, it occurs at about 0.2 milliseconds, and for low, 
temperature ignition, we were expecting about a millisecond or under a, mil, uh, under a fraction of a tenth of a millisecond. I don't know if I said that right. About 0.1 milliseconds for low and about 0.2 milliseconds for hot ignition. By contrast, for the UAV condition, uh, we find that the ignition delay times for this two-stage ignition are very, very different. They're much longer because the temperature, ambient temperature is 750 calvins cold. And so we see low temperature ignition occurring at about two and a half milliseconds. Um, and we see hot ignition occurring, again, here about five or six milliseconds. So order, you know, order magnitude longer than what we expect from ground uh, conditions. And in this case, both the high and the low temperature ignition occur lean of stoichiometric, which is here a little bit over 0.06. So this kind of gives you your reference point before we start to add turbulence on top of this. Um, the, the adaptive mesh refinement code that we used here is the Lomach Peli LM code. And it's uh, based on um, uh, what an AMRX and previously BoxLib uh, AMR framework developed out of Lawrence Berkeley Labs. And it uses a spectral deferred correction method for the fluid dynamics chemistry coupling and um, is, it is open source code that you can check out or have a look at, and that's the URL where you can look at the GitHub um, repository for this code. The resolution here that's required for these rich premixed cool flames at this high pressure are, are of the order of a micron, even smaller than what we looked at before. And we've found it very instrumental um, to first perform some coarse mesh simulations that are not quite as resolved uh, before we narrow down and, and simulate a few very, very resolved calculations. And the size of these simulations that are still ongoing are on the order of a billion cells uh, with AMR, which if you didn't have AMR would have been about 100 billion cells, which is not possible without it. And we use the exact same uh, endodecane mechanism for this study as we did for previous studies. And on the image on the right, you can see that there's about three or three levels of mesh refinement in these thin flame and ignition fronts. So let's first talk about the ground case, which we can kind of compare with what we had seen before in the temporally evolving uh, endodecane jet. And I'm going to show you a movie sequence here um, that shows from left to right the pilot mixture fraction the main injection mixture fraction, uh, the temperature, which is this going to be this third frame, the low temperature species uh, represented here by H2O2, and the high temperature species OH on the far right. And then what on top of these quantities, these isocontours, I will show you the, um, the stoichiometric mixture fraction isoline and half of its value on the lean side. So you can get a reference of where reactions are occurring in the mixture space. So what you see first, I'll stop the movie, is the pilot injection. And the pilot ignites. This is before. So the mixture fraction of the pilot is shown here. The main hasn't been injected into the system. You see auto ignition and hot occurring here on the, on the edges of the shear layer as they saw experimentally and what we also saw from the temporal calculations. And you see the production of a lot of the ketohydroperoxide, formaldehyde, and H2O2 species in the rich core of the, of, the, of the pilot jet. And then subsequently you see this sheath around the high temperature uh, autoignition of OH. So if I continue this movie, You'll then see the main injection following in the heels of the pilot. Here's the main going off, as you can tell from the main mixture fraction. The pilot, in the meantime, is leaned out. And, um, and, and what you see is that the main injection follows the slipstream of the pilot, so it's accelerated. And you then also see ignition occurring um, again, in the rich core of the main jet. Uh, and I'll talk about that in a minute, because it's pretty broad band across a wide range of mixture, rich mi mixture fractions. Uh, 
And then you see the merging of the OH um, sheath around both the main and the, and the pilot. So in this ground example, uh, the main is being injected into the products of combustion of hot ignition from the pilot, as well as the hot enthalpy that's being provided from the pilot. So both of those are assisting the acceleration of the overall ignition delay. Now, <clears throat> we've, going back to the reference conditions again, um, this was the curve I showed you of the ground uh, mixture fraction time plot for temperature here. Um, and H2O2 H and then OH are shown here. OH is peaked along the stoichiometric mixture fraction line. HO2 is peaked here in the low temperature ignition part of the diagram. And the interesting thing is if we then go back to this homogeneous case, but because we know from the simulation that uh, when you, the main is injected into the pilot uh, products, which uh, are basically can be represented as equal, uh, equilibrated, equilibrated a uh, very lean mixture with a mixture fraction of 0.01. So a bunch of hot products with, with uh, a little bit of you know, OH and, and water and CO2 and various other things. And so if we now uh, represent this homogeneous reactor with oxidizer that has this equilibrated lean mixture, the ignition delay curves look very, very different. So whereas before low and high temperature ignition occur at 0.1 and, and a little over 0.2 milliseconds. Here we find that low temperature ignition is, occurs much more quickly for the main injection or for this mixture that has a little bit of products of combustion from the, from the pilot. It occurs at about half of, half of the time. It's about 0.05 milliseconds. Whereas the hot ignition is, is not changed um, that much, maybe a little bit quicker um, when you have, have the pilot injection in the presence of the pilot. We all, oh, the other point I wanted to make is that the main will now, whoops, the main ignition, uh, the main jet uh, now sees a low temperature ignition occurring at much richer conditions than in a single jet. The pilot, when the pilot, in, ignited here, the low, the low temperature H202 soup was peaked, had its maximum at under, um, ver, under leaner conditions, and now it's increased by almost a factor of three to richer conditions of about 0.15, where we first start to see um, low temperature ignition happening. So that's another major difference. Uh, if we look at the conditional statistics like we had done before for the single endodecane jet, we can see the temperature conditioned on the pilot mixture fraction. Uh, as we progress from the middle of the first injection, end of first injection, towards the beginning of the second primary in jet injection, to the middle of the second injection and end. And you can kind of see the same sort of development. It ignites um, at the preferred mixture fraction and go, moves over into richer uh, temperature moves into, uh, starts to increase, I'm sorry, the H2O2 and moves towards richer mixtures, um, disappears when high temperature ignition occurs. And then during the second injection, the low temperature chemistry occurs at much richer conditions con consistent with the reference homogeneous reactor simulation. Likewise, OH is increased um, uh, once you have hot ignition occurring and it, it has its maximum on the stoichiometric isosurface. So the main difference in the evolution from the single injection that we talked about is that low temperature ignition occurs under very, very rich conditions in the presence of the pilot. Uh, we found similar results when we compared the conditional um, temperature with respect to mixture fraction and scalar dissipation rate. Same picture that mixing rates impede the progress of low temperature ignition. Um, however, when we have the second main injection, 
now you have the, not only the pure scalar dissipation rate, but you have the cross dissipation rate between the pilot gases and the main. And um, initially, and so the cross dissipation rate takes on uh, a negative value initially when the, um, the mixture from the pilot is opposing the mixture from the main. But as turbulent mixing brings those into alignment in time, then you end up transitioning from negative to positive uh, values of the cross dissipation rate. And the interesting thing is when you have negative dissipation, cross dissipation rates early on during the main injection, that uh, impedes the progress of ignition, similar to what we found for the single jet during the pilot injection. But then later, as, the, as you have turbulent mixing of the pilot with the main to the point where you have positive cross dissipation rate, then mixing um, actually speeds things up and it, it is favorable. And so similar to what we'd seen before as well, um, we looked at the cross uh, correlation between the progress variable uh, and the pilot scalar dissipation rate <clears throat> for both the first injection on the left as well as the second, the main injection on the right. And we see this negative island of correlation where um, uh, ignition progress is impeded by high mixing rates. Uh, <clears throat> right here at early time. And then again on the rich side, we see, uh, for very rich conditions, we see that it's positively correlated. So this is consistent with what was seen before. So I think for the, for the ground case, the first and second stage pilot ignition is consistent with the temporal evolving case. Um, and accelerated ignition for the main injection is consistent with what people have seen in experiments. We, we find that strong mixing inhibits the ignition of the first injection and it promotes ignition of the second injection. Now if we move to the UAV case, which is very different, here we see from the same time sequence, the pilot, the main, mixture fractions, temperature, heat, formaldehyde, H2O2 and OH, and I'm going to play the evolution where the red line, ISO lines on top of the quantities represents the stoichiometric mixture, uh, mixture fraction, and the white line is half of its value, so it's under very lean conditions. And so as we inject the pilot, recall here the pilot had a very short injection and then a very long dwell time of about a millisecond before the main was injected. And so you see evolution of the pilot um, where there is no formation of keat or any of the low temperature species prior to the injection of the main. And so the main goes into this, is injected into this very, very leaned out dilute pilot mixture which doesn't have any evidence of substantial keat or low temperature ignition or, or hot ignition. And then what we see is eventually the high temperature, um, the main jet undergoing low temperature and high temperature ignition, and then it eventually um, auto ignites. So you can see at this frame that the main injection has undergone low temperature ignition in the core, central core of that jet. And uh, before the H2O2 goes up, the keat, keto hydroperoxide spreads entirely across the front end of the plume. Um, and keat is, and formaldehyde are just slightly lagging the evolution of the, uh, of the keat radical. And then the keat some time later disappears in the head and formaldehyde and, and H2O2 um, form in the head of the jet. And the keat vanishes, the temperature starts to go up slightly in the leading edge of the plume. And then you see hot temperature, high temperature ignition first occurring on one of the lobes of the, um, of the plume. Where, and, you, and that's simultaneous with the appearance of OH radical on the right. And so that's a very different picture than what we saw from the ground case. And we, when we compare this 
sequence of no pilot for this uh, UAV conditions with the inclusion of a pilot on the bottom uh, row, we see that no pilot lags way behind the ignition progress that, that you would have if you had included a pilot. So for example, you see lots and lots of um, formaldehyde and H2O2 in the presence of a pilot that uh, doesn't exist uh, in, the ab in its absence. And so even though the low temperature first, the, the pilot, you don't see any evidence of ignition occurring, it is starting to generate a low concentration of some of these important radicals, KEAT and so on, that really accelerate the main injection jet. So again, comparing that, you can see that ignition occurs much sooner and lots more radicals in the case with the pilot. So there's a clear acceleration uh, by including the, this pilot. Um, we also can quantify the degree of mixing between the, the pilot and main jet mixture fractions by uh, plotting the joint uh, PDFs of the pilot and main mixture fraction and computing their correlation coefficient, which, uh, which is very high. It's as we go forward in time from, um, especially at the time of low and high temperature ignition of the main jet, you can see the correlation coefficient showing intense mixing between the two jets is about 0 .8, 0 0.83 to 0.86, which is very high. Um, for modeling purposes, we have access to things like the scalar dissipation rate um, early on for the, the pilot uh, dissipation rate, the main jet scalar dissipation rate, and even the cross dissipation rate plotted here on a log scale. And as I said earlier, you can see the transition from um, negative values when they're initially the mixture gradients are opposed between the pilot and the main. Uh, to becoming positive uh, later in time, as shown by this uh, change in color from blue to red. Uh, and if we look at the PDFs of the scalar dissipation rates, we can see that um, from left to right, the pilot, main, and cross dissipation rates. The pilot and the main are well represented by a log normal distribution. Uh, but this, the cross scalar dissipation rate, which currently isn't being modeled or predicted, is not represented by log normal distribution, but appears to have more of a stretched exponential type of behavior. If we look at other statistics like the conditional means of the low temperature radical ketohydroperoxide, um, these are you can see it's conditioned on both the pilot mixture fraction on the ordinate as well as the main mixture fraction on the abscissa. And we're going forward in time across the top row and then the second row, bottom row. And we can see that the formation of KEAT occurs first in the pilot fluid where the mixture fraction of, of the main is, is almost zero. And then it starts to grow and expand uh, from the pilot it intensifies and then it expands into, into the main, uh, into the richer conditions to where by the time um, you have main jet low temperature ignition, it's uh, got a distribution that spans both the pilot and the main. And so it's, it, you can see its involvement in, in time. If we can look at the conditional mean of KEAT with respect to the sum of both mixture fractions, the pilot and the main, for a case where you have single injection is shown in red versus the case when you have both the pilot and the main injection shown in blue, you can see that um, the pilot is able to provide a lot more uh, of these low temperature radical species, these peroxy species, to very, very rich conditions than if you had only a single jet. And so I think that's what's helping to really accelerate ignition under these more difficult to ignite high altitude conditions. Uh, so why don't we take a break here before we come back and I, then we'll talk a little bit about reheat combustion. So how about a five minute break? Oh, should I, I should ask if there's any questions about this part of the lecture. Yes. <laughs> 
So that's um, a little bit ad hoc at the moment. You, you can, you know, generally you pick gradients of, of species, the critical species that are very, very steep, um, and, you know, pick thresholds of gradients or combinations of that. You could define a metric that, for example, with sprays that depends on, on um, you know, other quantities to have a multi, have a, a weighted metric. Okay, I think well let's let's stop here for about 5 minutes. <laughs>